Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, we're back in a dark grey, almost black, for another Fact Friday. So if you haven't already, please go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, and you'll get a whole bunch of free goodies. We also have an academy there which is full of a couple of thousand rather lovely people who are very, very supportive of each other. It's an incredible place to learn and grow and frankly just share amazing ideas with. And of course, if you liked the video, please hit the like button. Best of all, leave a comment below. I love reading the comments and I love responding to the comments. And these comments are what we use in future Fact Fridays. So without further ado, let's get started. What are your thoughts on live instruments versus programmed instruments? Is it cheating or does it depend? It's definitely not cheating because if you think about it, everything we play, a drum, a keyboard, a guitar, you know, it's, it's an action. So if, you're, if you've got a MIDI keyboard and you're triggering a sound, you know, it's still, you know, an action. You're still taking notes and playing them together and creative chords and harmony and, of course, playing melodies. All of these things are just the same. Now, obviously, you can copy and paste things around, which you can't in the real world when you're playing an instrument. But once you've recorded something in analog, you can edit it around. So I would not say it's cheating. What are the pros and cons? Well, the pros are obviously this. If you've got a small studio, a small bedroom, and you're working in it, in your garage, whatever your environment is, and you've got to reproduce a drum kit, reproduce a piano, um, a sitar, you name it, things that you don't have access to, then obviously virtual instruments are un. Believable. The pros are having the ability to do string arrangements. What are the cons? Well, the cons are no matter what you do, it will never obviously be fully analog. Now, in many instances, that might not really matter because you might be doing a triangle part or, or like a little marimba melody or something. And frankly, you know, just bloom, 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 bloom. You know, you could play that on a marimba, you could trigger the sounds, you know, it's Nobody's really going to dispute or, or even question what instrument you use, whether it was virtual or not. But there are certain instruments that no matter what you do, do tend to suffer from sounding virtual and not sounding real. Hence, they wouldn't be called virtual. They'd be called organic, normally recorded real instruments or whatever phrase you want to use. I think the biggest con for, for using virtual instruments is when you want to have incredible dynamics. And think about it, when you're playing a guitar, it's not just the perfectly fretted, unbelievably well-plucked part that, you know, one in a million people play perfectly every time. That's all you get when you use a virtual instrument and you play a guitar sound, it's like blum, 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 blum. Everything is like perfectly plucked, perfectly performed, and that's fantastic. However, Unless you're sort of Tim Pierce on his best day ever, you're going to be a regular guitar player and it's going to suffer from, not even suffer, the point is you're going to play a chord and maybe you're playing the low strings heavier or softer than the rest of the strings. So there'll be a slightly different imbalance. That G chord is not going to be G, G, G every time. It's going to slightly move. So the beauty of organically recorded real instruments is how idiosyncratic, how random they are. That they might slightly not be fretted properly, they might slightly be holding or playing a little stronger on one set of strings or the other. All of this is rather tasty. I mean, if you think about just playing a guitar part and you want to emphasize the middle strings, but you still want to hear like the low E and the high E, you can. You can do that with your right hand. On a keyboard, yes, you can do it, but not with the same finesse that you can as a guitar player. So, pros and cons. Pros are access to everything you could ever imagine. Sitars, marimbas, um, you know, triangles, um, orchestras, drums, every kind of keyboard you can imagine, from a Hammond organ to a clavinet, everything. 
a Jaguar or Jaguar, as we would call it, you know, a Vox Continental, you know, all of these things now you have access to for fractions of the cost. I mean, you know, a couple of hundred dollars and you can download pretty much everything these days. So it's a wonderful world that we live in. But of course, the cons are that performance. But most of us, if not pretty much all of us, live in a world where we blend them all together. That really is the solution. You know, maybe you've got a live drum kit and you're adding some samples. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've got every single instrument naturally recorded, but you want a grand piano. I just have an upright piano. So where do I get a grand piano? A virtual grand piano. Um, there are so many ways that you can benefit from blending those two worlds together. And it's always been that way, you know, as far back as you can go, there's always been sort of a, a you know, uh, it's not a compromise, there's always been a marriage between old technology and new technology. It's just called the future, the present even. So don't be afraid to blend it. I don't think there's anything, it's not as you delicately put it in the question, it's not cheating. It's what we've always done. Some of the best music ever. My favorite period of the late 70s and early 80s was such a massive crossover point for synthesizers. And there were synths like Oberheims in, on albums and, and Moogs and you name it. And then the birth of the Roland, the JP8, for instance, the Jupiter 8. What a synth. Then, of course, the funny and quirky Yamaha DX7, which now, you know, is, is considered a classic. You know, we used to take that and put it through guitar pedals to make it sound a little less clean. It's an interesting world. It's always been a blend of different things. So no cheating, get creative, use it, and remember it's given you amazing access to incredible sounds. What are some tips for organizing the home studio for improving workflow? Are there any lessons from professional studios that we can apply in our more modest workspace? This is essentially, it's got a lot of equipment and it's jam-packed in here. There's tons of guitars, about 40 guitars and basses and couple of consoles and blah de blah blah. This is still my quote-unquote home studio, but it is equipped just like a, you know, quote-unquote commercial or professional studio, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's not run like a commercial studio. Why is that? Well, I think actually in a home studio, you can actually take some lessons from a commercial studio, but also, quite frankly, move past that. And the way to move past that is frankly, you leave things patched so you can use them. If you're in a commercial studio, you want that studio to be beautiful and empty and clean and ready to go. So when the client walks in and says, I need X, Y, and Z plugged in over here and that, off goes the assistant and they get it all set up for you. And it could be a completely different setup from the person before. Me, on the other hand, and you, if you have a home studio, would benefit from leaving things patched. You would. I have the drum kit always mic'd up. And the advantage of that is, is if we want to go and change or replay or play a new song on the drums, off we go. I go running in, boom, chink, boom, chink, done. It's not a case of like, oh, Eric, let's set up the drums. Let's choose some microphones. No, we've been doing this a long time. We know how to get a good drum sound. We have a cat at console sitting down there permanently miking the drum kit. And within a couple of minutes, we're recording drums. The same is for the bass, the same for guitars. Doesn't mean we don't change out mics, we change amps all the time. We have an amp rack there, we have different cabs, we have, um, how many 412s we have? Your, the, you have your Messer, my Marshall, and the Eddie Van Halen. So we have three 4x12s. And we have um, the Roadie, the little Carl Martin amp. And we have a single 12 tone tubby cab, which is phenomenal, we use all the time. The point is we're moving mics, we're moving cabs and all this stuff, but the, the chain is ready to go. It's just plug it in, move it, start playing. That's the reality. That is not what you do in commercial studios because you don't want something set up for a producer to come in and say he doesn't like the setup and you have to strike it and start all over again. So that's the interesting thing and the good thing about having a home studio is you leave things patched. My outputs, my template, when I'm mixing hybrid, goes through the console the same way each time. So when I want to go to the vocal, it's on channel 24, right in the middle so I can mix the vocal, and it's there every time. We set it up so the vocal comes up in the same place. You would never do that in a commercial studio unless you had locked it out for like three months to make an album. You know, there's no one way to do it. Every di different engineer and producer and mixer that's going to come into that studio has a different way. So 
if you're talking about the parallels and the positives from a commercial studio, it's probably just some basic organization. It's like, you know, wrapping your cables properly and hanging them when you're not using them. That's a number one thing and a, a great studio. Cables are already beautiful, always beautifully wrapped, wrapped properly, not round your arm like that, but looping, letting them follow a natural loop and then hung up and ready to go. So do that, basic organization. Always have a pencil, always have a Sharpie, always have board tape, you know, always have notepads handy so you can make notes. Those are things that you would expect in every commercial studio. Those are the things that I would have on board every day. So those are the basic things. I'm sure there's plenty of others. If you watching this have ideas about organization for home studios, please get down there and leave a bunch of comments and questions. Let us know what you think, what you'd like to know about commercial studios versus home studios. And if you have a home studio, which you think, think is very well run, let us know why you think it's well run and the tips that you can share with each of us. You've used the phrase print the DI a few times in other videos. And I think I know what you mean by that, but could you clarify and expand upon that? Yes, I realize this. Um, I've been working in music uh, my whole life. You know, I started making records as a musician. I've had studios, um, you know, I had two cassette players bouncing through stereos. I've had, you know, four track cassettes. I had ADATs. I had an MSR 24, one inch 24 track. I've worked on every medium. And then of course I ended up on two inch tape in the first bands that I was signed to and then eventually got into Pro Tools. Oh, and I used Cubase and Notator back in the olden days when it was just a sequencer, late 80s, early 90s. So I've been through the ringer of all of these different things. Why do I say print? Well, print is a term for recording on to tape. So when you hear us, guys like me, and even some of the younger guys coming up, you know, I've heard teenagers say print. What they mean is record, bounce it, or record it. It's really as simple as that. So when you're printing your final bounce, see what I just said, when you're printing your final bounce, when you're recording your final mix, I would say printing the final mix. So when I want to record the DI, I say, I'm going to print the DI. The reality is, is like, yes, it doesn't really make any sense in a modern world where you don't use tape machines. Not that it even really made sense then, because it's not like you're actually like printing you know, something that you could visibly see. It was just, you know, messing with the uh, electrons. <laughs> Magnetic tape after all. So it's an interesting term, but yes, those have been doing this for a while and have started off on tape or, have, or at least grown up in studio systems, you know, because they, they hear it now even in recording studios. Print means to record, either a final mix, individual track, whatever it might be. So if somebody says, can you print that? They mean, can you record it? So hopefully that clarifies, printing the DI is recording the DI at the same time as recording the mic. So if I wanted to reamp a guitar signal, I've got a nice clean, nice printed, recorded <laughs> DI track. Do you have a method for reacquainting yourself with a mix in progress after you've been away from it for a while? I often find myself staring at the screen saying, now what? I think if I stop to mix, early on, like I still hadn't got the drums right. I think that would be difficult to pick up. I think I would almost come back and probably think the same way, like now what? If I open up a mix and it's all over the place level-wise and panning and the drums don't sound good, it's, I'm not gonna be able to get back into it. I think for me, I can't walk away from a mix until I get it sounding good enough to walk away. Makes sense? So if I get the drums sounding pretty impactful and exciting, I put the bass in there, I put the guitars in there, I put vocals in there, and I'm pretty happy with it, I can walk away. And I can walk away for a, a couple of weeks. I can walk away for a couple of months because when I recall it, I'm going to have fresh ears and I'm going to be able to hear it and say to myself, oh, okay, I need a bit more of this. You know, the snare needs more ag aggression, more snap, more crack, whatever you want to call it. The vocals are too muffled, too quiet, too loud, whatever. Whatever. The panning needs to be readjusted. So for me, I understand that question, but I think that would only arise if I left a mix in an early stages for a couple of weeks or even a couple of days. I would come back going, what was I thinking? Or where did I leave this? For me, 
I try not to leave a mix unless it's at a level where I could recall it and listen to it and decide what to do to it. I think if you are struggling and you're at an early stages and it's two o'clock in the morning, just stop the mix. Go back to the original rough or wherever you had it before. So when you come back like two weeks later, you can open up the original rough where you were before with fresh ears and refocus on it. And then if you want, you can go back to that half done mix and see if there's anything redeeming about it. But it's very, very difficult for me to sort of like half mix something and then walk away from it and then come back a period later and expect to understand it whatsoever. I would never understand it. I would be just as confused as you. So basically don't start something that you can't sort of get to a point to sound great. And I don't mean like radio ready, absolutely amazing, best mix you've ever done, but at a point where you can walk away and go, oh yeah, I like that, you know, and then come back and hear it and work on the issues. So I get what you're saying, but I think what it probably is, is like you haven't left the mix feeling confident that, that, that you've really accomplished something. That's really what you need to do. Leave the mix at a point where you feel confident and you feel like you've accomplished something and you'll be able to pick it up again. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you ever so much. Hope you're having a marvelous time recording and mixing. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. This is the place where we look for Future Fact Friday. If you haven't already, please subscribe, hit the like button, and of course, if you hit that bell, you'll be notified when we do another video. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing and I'll see you again very soon. <laughs>